of, of being a little more slender. Yes, yes. I have a philosophy. Hello, welcome to Chapter and Verse. Ray Dempsey has produced another um, wonderful show, and we have um, one of our constant guests, huh? quite <laughs> frequent, Reverend Dr. Donald Anderson, the uh, Executive Minister of Rhode Island State Council of Churches. Great. Thank you. And Stephen Alquist, thank you for no, being here. No problem, thank Praise you. Praise guests. Oh, yes, it's, we were just talking about um, Socrates in the City. This is one of the books that arrived in the mail, that, that arrived in the mail, and uh, it's well reviewed by Chuck Colson and, and uh, Peter Kraft and the editor himself, Eric Metaxas. Eric has a wonderful sense of humor. When John came to speak, he, uh, Eric has a, um, um, a series of um, talks. And he invited uh, Sir John Polkinghorne to, um, to, uh, to be in, in one of the talks. And uh, of course, Sir John Polkinghorne is a knight of the British Empire. So Eric Metaxas asked him if he could wear his armor. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote a couple of other books. Eric Metaxas wrote, wrote, actually wrote a couple of books, a biography of William Wilberforce. Oh, absolutely. Who, who almost single-handedly ended slavery in, in England. Mm -hmm. He, with, his, with his friend, uh, Wonderful. Pastor John Newton. That's right. And um, he wrote another book about a um, uh, Diedrich Bonhoeffer. Oh, oh sure. yeah. And One of my real heroes. Really? Yeah, absolutely. An amazing man who stood up uh, to, the, to uh, the horrors of Hitler and uh, Nazism and ultimately paid the ultimate price for that, was ultimately executed for oh. his stand. Alex, so courageous. Alex's book might be... <clears throat> One of the best, his biography, if you can get a hold of it. I'll do that. It's, it's great. Uh, well, it's the morning mail. Um, Peter Kraft is in it. Alexander, I mean, Alistair McGrath, another fellow from Britain. Mm -hmm. uh, Chuck Colson is in it. N.T. Wright is in it. Paul Vitz is in it. The late, sir, sir, uh, the late uh, father, Richard John Newhouse. And uh, Dr. Francis Collins is in it. Uh, he's a, a Christian, and he was al he's also uh, the fellow who was leading the genome project to map our genome. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. We have two other things in the mail. Um, 48 liberal lies about American history that you probably learned in school. And what would the founders say? A patriot's answer to America's most pressing problems, both by Larry <coughs> Swinehart. Oh, okay. Well, um, I was wondering, uh, oh, Steve, you, you're probably the most famous of us. Really? Um, okay. Today. I did not know that. <laughs> um, um, the, there's been a, a, the Cranston prayer banner has been in the news a lot. Mm -hmm. The national news as well. Yes. And. Um, You've been um, affiliated with the controversy. Yeah, my niece Jessica is the girl at the center of it, it seems, yes. How is she doing? Um, she's doing fine. She's a really strong, smart, capable girl, and she handles it with you know, a sense of humor. So she's doing very well. That's good. Yeah. That's very good. Very yeah. good to hear. It is. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of her. Uh, people would like to know, how are things in school? Um, you know, she, she's got some work to make up, and, it, and it's been difficult at times, but, you know, she, like I said, she's strong, and she's still working on it, and, you know, as far as I know, she's doing fine. You know, I'm very close to her, and, you know, I try to give her whatever help I can. Is, so. is there an amount of understanding and support for her in the school? There is some. She has friends, and she has some teachers who have come out um, for her, and there are some people who are not obviously, but uh, it's, so it's a mixed bag, but she does have close friends who have stuck with her through the whole thing, and she's got people who have come to her afterwards and said, you know, I'm glad you did what you did. You know, maybe they didn't see her way originally, but they've come around and they feel that she took a brave principle stand, even if they don't agree with her, which I think is the best you can hope for. Does she have any Christian friends? <clears throat> yes, she does. She has friends, she has um, a Muslim friend, she has many different friends, yes, uh, Jewish friends, absolutely. She's not, and she's not herself in any way prejudiced mm -hmm. or, um, you know, bigoted in any way. Well, it's a, an important case. Yeah. Uh, it, um, Rhode Island has had some important cases. Lee versus Weitzman made it to the Supreme Court. That's right. Sure. That's right. 
Yeah, you know, the Cranston School Banner is uh, near and dear to my heart because I was in Cranston West. I, I was there for six years. It was a junior senior high then, so I didn't stay six years at high school. It was, it was uh, grade seven through 12. And I was actually there from 1960 to 1966. So when the banner went up, I was there. And of course, in that time, we were a new school. Uh, so we were, you know, identifying school colors and school mascot, and in those days you kind of had a school prayer. And I remember as a student, what were never, your school colors in that? Oh, oh, they still are, are red so, and gray. Same one. Red yeah, and gray? Yep, yep, red and gray. In fact, I wouldn't embarrass anybody, but I actually can still sing the school fight song, and I will do that <laughs> on your program because that would be they, the, the FCC would pitch you off for, you know, horrible programming. But the. Um, uh, but as uh, you know, I got older and, and, and we reflected on this, and as, as a, a Baptist true to Roger Williams' principles, as much as obviously prayer is an important part of my life, and I'd love it to be an important part of you know, everyone's life, the idea that the state, uh, whether it be the state of Rhode Island or, or a city or the federal government, would endorse one particular prayer over another is where it seems to me we violate the principles of separation of church and state. And we were talking earlier about one of my rabbi friends, Rabbi Amy Levin, <coughs> uh, in Israel right now. But um, she has, uh, her congregation, Torah Israel, uh, is on Park Avenue in Cranston. And many of her uh, congregants grew up in Cranston. And so she just kind of went back and talked to them and said, you know, when you were a student there, uh, did that bother you? And they said, well, yes, it bothered us, but we didn't want to say anything because we didn't want to bring down all of what would come if we did that. And certainly what happened to Jessica was yes. reason why they hesitated. So every once in a while, someone says, well, it never bothered anybody since, you know, since the early 60s. And that's not true. It's bothered a lot of people. But it was only until Jessica came along who was willing to say, it bothers me and I'll take the grief for it. Uh, that um, we acted. And I would hope that the prayer uh, that was there, that prayer banner, uh, now it has come down and uh, they're still deciding where they're going to put it, but I'd like to see it in some place where the public could have access to it mm -hmm. and that it might launch a conversation about the place of religion in American life. Because I think that really is mm. the conversation that we should be having. And that there's respect for folks who are people of faith and respect for people who, who don't have a faith. You know, that together we can share ideas, find where there's common ground, so that together, you know, we build uh, a better place. That's the whole idea of the lively experiment, mm -hmm. you know, that, that Rhode Island is. Mm. Um, I, have a, I have a concern. Uh, I'm, I'm a, I'm, <coughs> I have a concern that the church may be, I don't know how to, to fix this, but the church may be being um, marginalized. Well, you know, I think, you know, we find out whether the church is marginalized. People vote with their feet. Yes. If people show up at worship, they're valuing what's there. Yeah. If people don't show up at worship, then that says something too. It does. And I think, you know, I'm a pastor, so I'll, I'm going to, I don't have Baptist pastor, I'm going to talk about Baptists. I'm not going to, you know, bag anybody else. I'll, I'll just beg Baptists. But, you know, often what happens, and it's the most human of things that can happen. What is your church? Uh, Baptist. I'm an American Baptist. Well, what's the name of it? Oh, the ch well, I do, I'm now with the Council of Churches, so I don't pastor a church right now. Oh, right Up right until right. I came to this job five years ago, I was the minister at the First Baptist Church in East Greenwich. That was my last congregation. The um, <clears throat> many, uh, what's happened to many of our churches is that we have kind of lost our, our central message of uh, Christ and concern for those outside the walls, and we've really become more concerned about what happens inside the walls and about sustaining an institution instead of sustaining a movement. Very and, good point. Uh, and Very so good point. I, I think that if, if anybody is to blame for the marginalization of church, I would say we're the first in line. Now, some other people are doing some unkind things, and that's unfortunate. Yeah. But I think we've got to look at ourselves first and say, you know, uh, have we sometimes gone astray by focusing on maintaining buildings and maintaining structures and not really on reaching out and uh, being uh, earnest and sincere with people? Yeah, I've watched things like the building fund take prominence mm -hmm. in the life of a congregation. 
and it, it uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's good to have a parking lot. You know, that's the sure. thing, people need to park. And uh, it's rough to park, it, rough to have no parking in the snow and all that. But um, to, to have a, a, the building fund uh, a, a accomplish a prominence in um, the life of an assembly, uh, when other things like love might not be as important. There was a, a survey which was quoted by um, Josh McDowell. We, mm -hmm. we, we talked about this before. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of young people are, are, not, are not interested in, in going to churches any, anymore. Right. And uh, there's been some surveys about, you know, why. And uh, Josh quoted a survey and uh, apparently the young people are concerned about two things, a lack of love and the presence of hypocrisy right. in, inside the churches. Mm -hmm. Those are very important concerns, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, you know, Steve comes from a different perspective in the Humanist Society. I'd be interested to hear what he thinks about that. Yeah, I was just going to ask oh, you. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I think one of the poll, one of the studies you're referring to talked about what they call the nuns as the large, fastest growing Group of people who don't identify with any religion. Oh. They're called, they're generically called the nuns, and um, they. I think what they're trying to do is they're basically seeking their own path outside of a religious institution. But I think what they're also finding is that there's many things that they don't have in the real world that a religious institution might bring them, like easy avenues to charity, easy avenues to um, things like childcare or things on the weekends for them that they don't, they're not finding. Even things like camp for their children, they're not finding that. And so um, in a, as a secular movement, what people are trying to do there is to supply those types of services to nuns, N-O-N-E-S, yeah. um, so that they can have what they feel is like missing from church in the social aspect or in a charitable giving aspect, but still have it for them as well. And, there's a lot of work to be done in that. You know, it's not easy to find to find a charity, for instance, and do it on a sustained every week basis. You know, anybody can make a one-time donation, but you do that every week when you go to your church and you just drop something in the basket. That's a little bit different, and I think that's one of the challenges of being a secular person. And so the, the the organizations are in search of nuns. Yeah, well, I think they're trying to cater to that because mm -hmm. I think they're finding, and, it, as, and I think you're right about the hypocrisy that's driving people out of like certain churches and out, out of certain things because they're not seeing um, an attempt, you know, I mean, you can take a strong, um, you know, you can say I'm pro-life but be pro-death penalty. Yes. And I think when people see that, they say, well, what does that mean? How is that pro-life? And that pushes them out of a church that makes that kind of demand on its people and says, you know, what they want is they want either some sort of consistency and they may find themselves pro-life and anti-death penalty, and, f and of course that makes perfect sense to those people. And they well, they're not interested in the Bible. Right, they don't have a Aren't church. those biblical churches who believe yeah. such as that? Yeah. Which right. I there's do. There's also interpretation, yeah. I mean, because a lot of people might read the Bible and they might see, you know, they might want to read it metaphorically, and other people tell them it has to be literal. And when yeah. they say it has to be literal, that loses people too. They say, well, I just don't believe in a talking snake. I don't believe in, you know, the certain things. And when they run up against that, they get pushed out. They don't don't understand they may be a they can move like through religions and find them another religion that might find them they just might that might just like break them they you know I know and there was also a lot of, awful lot of people who are hurt by religion you know they come out of certain religious groups and they're hurt and I meet people occasionally who are you know they're just very in a lot of pain and they they don't trust churches, they don't trust ministers, and yeah. you see that sometimes, and I think... Um, of course you can't generalize. You can't generalize, I don't no. think it's everybody, but I mean, you know, wonderful, if, wonderful if you churches. work with LGBT youth especially, they come out of churches, and a lot of them say, well, I came out of a very religious family, and as an LGBT teen, I had no acceptance of my family, no acceptance of my church, and so when a person comes to them wearing a collar, or some person comes to them as a person of faith, they just reject that outright because they don't feel there's a place for them. And there may well be a place for them, but they don't feel it. They have to open their hearts, not just close down because they were in a bad church. No, that could be, that could be but yeah, a lot of people... They have to open up their hearts, right. open up. Right, I think it's possible to have an open heart <clears throat> and not necessarily believe in supernatural things, which is where I'm from. I yeah. consider myself a humanist. Oh, and humanist, a, yeah. Yes, a humanist. And in fact, I'm the president of the Rhode Island Humanist Society, oh. or what we call the Humanists of Rhode Island. Interesting. And so, 
Okay. How, how do you, when, when somebody from the homosexual background comes to you, how can you minister to him as a, as a, a, a representative of Jesus? Yeah, well, I, you know, and this is where we may get a good debate going here, uh, <laughs> because I, I think that, um, uh, and this is what happens, you know, when we look at scripture, uh, as I look at some of the passages that relate to uh, homosexuality, uh, I understand them a little differently than some people do. And my concern uh, with a person who uh, is uh, gay or uh, of any issue is to first treat them with love, and you know, if someone, if, if this is the way they are, uh, and they express that in a monogamous, uh, healthy relationship, you know, then I, I personally don't have a problem with that. I think the, I have a problem with promiscuity, because I think the scripture talks a lot about promiscuity, and people who uh, move, don't even aren't in relationships, but just, uh, you know, go from one person to another person to another person, I. I not only think that's wrong because I think the Bible says it's wrong, but I think the Bible says it's wrong because it, it hurts a person. It, it, you know, a God has, I think, created us to live in relationship. And I think there's a number of people who even aren't religious who would talk about the importance of relationships with one another. And uh, I, I think that our, our sexuality uh, should be expressed within a loving relationship. So. Um, I'm not so bothered by a relationship that may be two people of the same sex uh, if they are um, in a committed and loving and caring relationship. In fact, I know many Christian people who are uh, uh, in same-sex relationships that love each other and are very faithful Christian people. Now, I know there's other folks who would say, that's, that can't be, I understand that. But that's where we look at the scripture and, mm. and understand the scriptures differently. And um, the... Uh, Sometimes, uh, you know, even if a church would have a different view than mine about uh, the gay, about folks that are gay, uh, even if they reject that lifestyle, how that gets rejected can make a big difference too. Someone can say, you know, yeah. this isn't who we are, mm -hmm. okay, but we wish you no ill, we don't want to hurt you. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times what happens is if a young person or someone else comes in, uh, to uh, a, a church or a congregation that believes that way, they're often shunned and you know treated as being evil, you know, and pushed out. And I, I, I think that I don't think we honor Christ when we exercise that kind of attitude. What a good point. Well, one of the things in the survey uh, said that a lot of young people who are uh, discouraged uh, in the, about the lovelessness of uh, uh, in the churches are concerned about. Uh, what they believe is the hypocrisy about how how the churches um, uh, deal with with uh, homosexuals. Um, what, do you, would you have a prescription for a church? <laughs> well, you know, you know, it, I, in a simple way, yes. I mean, there's no simple answer to any situation. But I think, you know, if we're talking about churches, and I think, it, you know, I'll, let me talk again about what I'm familiar with. I think that the principles could apply to a, uh, a synagogue or to a mosque <coughs> or anything else. But, you know, it, it seems to me that uh, we must first understand what our faith calls us to. Uh, you know, I think of the words of the prophet Zechariah, uh, who um, kind of summed up the teaching of all the Hebrew prophets when he said uh, that God has called us to render to judgments, and he, there he's talking about justice and, and being just, to uh, demonstrate kindness and love, and to not oppress the widow, the orphan, the alien, uh, and uh, the poor. I, I think that all of us can look at those kinds of concepts and say th those are important things that speak to living ourself out. Uh, you know, Jesus said if you want to save your life, lose it. You know, I think that means that you give your life away, you know. And I think we give it away in that, in that kind of way that Zechariah talked about. And that can happen in so many different ways. You know, it's going to contextualize itself very different in a storefront church that's uh, in the urban area in, you know, Pawtucket or Central Falls or Providence than it is in a rural church out in Richmond someplace. Uh, but that same print, those same principles still apply. And uh, I know, I think size, we, we've got to get over the idea that size means success. Mm -hmm. Size, success 
is about how effective we are in being faithful to what God's called us to. That's what success is about. And so we might have a small congregation, but that congregation may be living out, right. the, in, my, yes. in our case, the Christian message, uh, in a very vital way in its community. I've seen that with small churches. Yeah, yep. and I, I, in my mind, they're a success. They may not have, you know, 5,000 people in worship on Sunday morning, but I, you know, that really is not, the, in my view, at least in my understanding of the scriptures, that's not the, uh, right. that's not the mm -hmm. uh, judgment of, of whether Amen. somebody's successful or not. You know, I think it's very important how we treat other people. That's why, you know, uh, a number of ministers uh, and rabbis and imams got together to support Jessica's right to object to the banner. Uh, every person that spoke at the press conference that we had, how long ago was it, do you remember? Was it oh, two months ago? Yeah, about that. About two months ago. Uh, fervently believe in prayer. <laughs> they all pray all the time. They, they, you know, prayer is an important part of their life. Mm. Uh, but they also realized that it's really important that I make a free choice to pray. Yes. And, um, and in order for me to have a free choice to pray, I have to have a free choice not to pray. And um, that is, is something that I think it's very important. So although prayer is critical in my understanding of spiritual life and what, it, what my sense of piety is all about, um, I have to honor uh, the fact that somebody else has to have the freedom to choose that or not choose that. And I can't stand by if somebody else is trying to force something down you know, someone's throat or, or insist on something. And that's why those people of faith got together to defend a young woman who, uh, at this point in her life at least, is, is not claiming to be a person of faith and, and was offended by that prayer. I think it's, a, I, I, I hope that people saw that as not being hypocritical, but that they were being consistent with their, with their faith tradition and not saying, we want freedom for ourselves, but we don't want it for this person over here. I mean, I think that's, that's really, really important. Mm. Do, do you think? Do you think that the witness of the church is, uh, in some way, mitigated with uh, the, the the uh, the removal of um, of um, traditional and historical? You know, I, I don't I don't think so because uh, having grown up in the Cranston school system and having been there. Uh, when that prayer was designed, uh, when I was in uh, elementary school, uh, we said the Lord's Prayer every day. I mean, that's a very specific Christian prayer. Yeah. And, you know, and of course it was, it was interesting because uh, I happened to, at those days I was raised a Methodist. I chose to be a Baptist later. Uh, but the uh, most Protestant churches uh, recognize uh, the uh, one um, version of the Lord's Prayer that comes from one gospel, and then there's another version that comes from another gospel and that's a little shorter. And the Roman Catholic Church recognizes that. So when we would say it, you know, uh, most of the young people in my class in Western Cranston were Roman Catholic by tradition. And so they, we'd all say the Lord's Prayer, uh, except for the one or two Jewish students or, or somebody who didn't say anything and had to sit there quietly. Uh, and then we'd get, they'd get to deliver us from evil and then there'd be two or three of us go, well, there's a kingdom for the glory for I mean, and, uh, you know, So even, even in, in, in doing a specific Christian prayer, there was discrimination there. Right. And, uh, and I would feel very badly uh, if um, I sent uh, my child to a public school, not a religious school, yes. but if I sent my child to a public school and there was a prayer being said that was not a prayer of my faith tradition and my child was asked to at least endure it. I mean, you know, I would say, this is a public school. Yes. What's this here? If it's a religious school, that's a whole different ball game. You yeah. know, then, then you expect that to be there. Yeah. But I think in a public school where we know we have folks that are not, uh, either not of, a, of any faith tradition or from a variety of faith traditions, it's better, I think, there to leave prayer in the personal practice and in the worship of the, uh, of the church. Uh, or, the, or the synagogue or mosque or whatever the religious tradition is there. Well, I wanted to get your prescription too. Uh, you're, are, you, are you affiliated with churches at all? No, I'm not. I'm a, so you're I'm, kind of an onlooker from the outside. Yeah, I was raised Catholic, but uh, I've moved away from that. And uh, I consider myself. I was a, too. Yeah, I consider myself a humanist, probably an atheist. Would you have a prescription for, for a church that wants to be a, a witness for the Lord, mm -hmm. loves the Lord, believes in the Lord? 
and somehow uh, could use some advice. You know, I'm not sure what to say to a church on that level, to be honest. Um, I, you know, my feeling is that I have a responsibility to the truth and I have responsibility to, you know, reality and stuff. And I don't see those stories as being true. So I don't, I wouldn't, I would say my first advice to anyone would be to be honest mm -hmm. and to help people. That would be my first, you know, and if you speak from a place of honesty and you really want to help people, then as a humanist, of course, helping humans would be right up my alley and I would be glad to partner with anyone who wanted to do those types of, that type of work. But as a, um, but I think when they're dis dishonest or when they're going after money or when they're covering up different types of improprieties, I think that's the problem and I think that I, I think it not only does it like bother me, but I think it shows a tremendous amount of disrespect for the tradition they're claiming to uphold and I think that's, that, that would be my only advice I could give is to be honest and to act out of your conscience mm. and out of a good conscience. How did, how did, let's talk about ourselves. Let's talk about how we became what we are, how we got here today. <clears throat> how did you become a Christian? It was in my late 20s. Didn't know a thing about born again Christianity, but um, I had a neighbor, Dot Madeiras, Dottie Madeiras, and uh, God bless her, she um, invited me to the uh, Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship. <laughs> they had the monthly uh, meetings. It was Valley Steakhouse at the time, which I ended up being the former waitress later on. Um, and now it's, gosh, it's a Super Shores supermarket forever. And um, eventually I went. I don't know, I was never the same again. It was like I was in a totally different world. <laughs> oh, the Holy Spirit had his way with me. And um, yeah, I was really born again. Ended up going to a, a really nice, small, mm -hmm. really on fire for the Lord, born again church in Freetown, uh, Massachusetts, and uh, Zion Bible College later on, all the beautiful memories there. How remember? about you now? That, that was in my late 20s. Do you remember what it was that got a hold of you? at the Full Gospel Businessmen's Association. Remember the, what was said? Or... The Holy Spirit doesn't ha really have to say anything, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Once he works upon your heart and your mind, and just wraps his loving arms around you. It's, it's like you're in a totally different world. You know, I, I could, could feel something supernatural there mm. at that Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship. Years down the line, um, I was at a nice dinner there and they w wanted me to speak and I couldn't because with their rules, I was a female. I asked you, remember? No. <laughs> remember? You don't remember no, that? I don't. This time, their monthly prayer meetings, yeah. um, dinner prayer meetings was at McGovern's restaurant. Yeah. Remember? No. You don't remember that? No. And you spoke for me. Because I was a female, you had to have a male speaker. Ugh. And uh, oh, it was really intelligent, you know, what you had said. Oh, thank it was you. biblical. You made sure it was biblical. That's Thanks. important now. Thanks. You don't remember? No. I do. <laughs> years you. and years ago. We were still so young, Ray. Was that when we were with Michael, Michael Tierney's church? That's where I met you. That's where we met. That's right. I was a superintendent of the little Sunday school there. Right. Downstairs. Reverend Mike Tierney, beautiful friend of mine. It was a shoebox church, mm -hmm. a storefront yeah. church. Yeah, storefront. It was yeah. Yeah. nothing big or anything like that. But there were a bunch of people who loved each other in the Lord. And we, we had some good teaching. Well, we had some good times now. <laughs> Got to wrap it up now. Well, will you, um, will you join us again next week for part two of this discussion? We thank you. We, um, will you join us again? Um, we thank our guests. Okay. Will, will you join us again I, next week? Our Heavenly Father same sure time, does love you. Same station, same place for part two of this discussion. Amen. Thanks.